Just about every other day, scientists within various fields of biology are discovering new species and are finding their understanding of species already cataloged. The most current estimate is about 8.7 million individual species of plants, animals, bacteria, fungi, and protozoa, although it's widely accepted in the field of taxonomy, which is the science of classifying life, that this is nowhere even near complete, with estimates ranging anywhere from a few hundred thousand to even millions more yet unidentified organisms still out there. But today, we're going to be discussing a particular group of organisms that when introduced to environments which they are not native to, can absolutely wreak havoc on the native fauna and flora, and in some cases, even collapse the entire ecosystem they find themselves in. These are colloquially referred to as invasive species. Invasive species are any kind of organism that is not native to a specific ecosystem, causes harm to the stability of local wildlife, whether by predation, infection, or outcompeting them, they have to grow and reproduce quickly and spread aggressively. Though not an exhaustive definition, this is generally the accepted criteria by which biologists decide whether a species is invasive or not. Though species can certainly travel to areas they aren't native to, like seed pods from a particularly aggressive plant catching a ride on migrating birds, or localized floods transporting aquatic life into new areas that were separated by land or dams, Oftentimes, humans are the means by which species can find new environments. We humans have pretty much mastered the craft of global travel over land, sea, and air, and invariably, with this new ability to travel vast distances, some critters are getting into pitching our ride with us as well. A great example of this is the shipping industry, and even recreational boating. Oftentimes, new aquatic organisms will catch a ride on watercraft such as algae, barnacles, or even phytoplankton caught up in the ship's ballast tanks, which is released from the ship upon docking. Ballasting is a technique large marine vessels use to stabilize the craft during long distance travel, where the ship sucks up the water to store in large tanks that is later discharged out once the ship has either reached its destination or they're in much calmer conditions. This practice is considered the primary vector by which non-native aquatic species will spread. In fact, it's estimated by the National Wildlife Federation that every day, thousands of non-native species are transported new areas every day via ballast water. One of the most notorious examples of this is the zebra mussel. Native to the lakes of Ukraine and southern Russia, this highly aggressive organism most likely began infesting the North American Great Lakes due to transoceanic vessels. The zebra mussel outcompetes other native organisms for oxygen and food, such as algae. Another particular species we all become uncomfortably accustomed to is the red imported fire ant. That's right, the fire ants that invade our yards every spring and summer actually originate from South America and found their home all over the globe in temperate and tropical climates within 50 years. Fire ants can also survive floodwaters and being adrift in the ocean for short periods of time. So they can actually establish themselves on remote islands during shipping accidents or natural disasters. Fire ants are considered amongst the worst invasive species on the planet as they can thrive just about anywhere that has a climate suitable for them. They will outcompete other local fauna within their ecological bracket and their sheer numbers mean that if left unchecked can even wipe out other insect species completely draining the local area of its resources. Birds cannot even nest because the fire ants will just climb into the canopies and attack the vulnerable chicks. Another good example of invasive species that have severely disrupted the local area are Burmese pythons. This is a snake native to Southeast Asia that gained substantial popularity as an exotic pet in the 90s and early 2000s, with somewhere between 75 and 100,000 snakes imported into the U.S., in 1992, Hurricane Andrew further contributed to this population explosion by destroying a python breeding facility and zoo, which allowed specimens to escape into the wild and further procreate. Now, the importation of Burmese pythons was officially banned in 2012, but by then it was already far too late. The reptiles had already firmly established themselves in the region, with all attempts at controlling or eradication having failed. A 2012 study concluded that in areas where the snake was already well-rooted, foxes and rabbits have already all but vanished, 
with raccoon, possum, and white-tailed deer populations reduced to unsustainable numbers. Even larger predators like bobcats have had their numbers drastically reduced by this reptile. This snake's only real competition is the American alligator. The two reptiles inhabit the top of the food chain in the area with few natural predators of their own and are often in conflict with one another, resulting in becoming a meal for each other. But the snake can simply outreproduce the crocodilian with much larger egg clutches as the female breeds every other year, produces a clutch of between 20 and 50 eggs, and can live up to about 20 years or more. Plants, however, can be just as destructive to a local habitat as the kuzu vine proves. Its species name is Purera montana and was introduced from the United States in 1876 from Japan and Southeast China. This is a creeping climbing vine that will completely overrun any area it is introduced to that has a favorable climate. From the 1930s through the 50s, it was promoted as an excellent choice for soil erosion but very quickly got out of hand, overtaking any other vegetation in the area and absorbing its nutrients for itself. This vine can be found all over the southeastern United States and is beginning to even make its way to the Midwest and Northeast, proving that virtually nowhere in the country is safe. As kudzu can grow up to a foot per day, its growth patterns are incredibly accelerated when compared to other flora and it will suffocate everything from native grasses to fully mature trees as covering them prevents the absorption of sunlight needed for photosynthesis. Over a short time, this loss of native plants will negatively impact the wildlife that has evolved and adapted alongside them to use them as food, refuge, and pollinators causing an ecological collapse and possibly even extinction of particularly vulnerable species. As kudzu thrives in regions with mild winters and hot summers, Accelerated anthropogenic climate change will likely make it even easier for this highly destructive plant to reach even further unencumbered as winters become even more mild and increased drought frequency are no problem for kudzu. The vine is highly versatile and very drought resistant and can resist dry periods better than other local plant life can. Humans have been largely responsible for the proliferation of highly corrosive invasive species around the world and many of them we don't even consider to be troublesome. The American bullfrog, brown rat, Louisiana crawfish, wild pigs, Japanese honeysuckle, even that purring ball of fluff in your lap right now. That's right, mittens is technically an invasive species. As cats have no native range, are found on every continent but Antarctica, can reproduce at just six months old, can have up to 12 offspring a year, and although hard data estimates are hard to come by, it's estimated that between 30 and 80 million feral cats inhabit the U.S. alone, with likely another 30 to 40 million pet cats with outdoor access. Domestic cats will kill even when not specifically hunting for feeding purposes. A 2013 study published in Nature Communications found that free-range domestic cats kill between 1.3 and 4 billion birds and between 6 to 22 billion mammals and reptiles annually. Feral cats make up the majority of this mortality, with them accounting for the outright extinction of over 33 species of modern bird, mammal, and reptile. This means that cats single-handedly account for a higher mortality among birds than man-made structures, vehicle collisions, poisoning, and wild predation combined. It's important to emphasize that the wildlife discussed in this video are not at fault. They're simply doing what organisms do, adapting to new environments as best they can and the constant arms race that is evolution. Though we don't check all the boxes, us homo sapiens could be considered something of an invasive species as well. We've had the greatest ecological impact on the planet of any species who's ever lived, and as our technological innovation and industrialization of our home world has seen the expansion of our species to every corner of the globe, the ability to terraform the surface as we erase forests and shear off entire mountainsides to make travel and commerce easier. We collect far more resources than needed for just survival and turn pristine wilderness into concrete jungles. I don't know, perhaps we aren't much better than the fire ants and the cockroaches that we try so hard to eradicate. At least they only take what they need. With the social commentary out of the way, what can we do about the problem of invasive species? Well, there's a few things that we've tried that have shown some limited success. Cargo inspection and quarantine of sea vessels 
has been moderately successful at limiting the spread of aquatic non-native organisms, but enforcement regulations is not uniform across all countries and many was non-existent. Targeted extermination programs carried out by world governments has also been selectively successful, with some key victories being the eradication of fire ants from New Zealand after they were introduced from transported goods and the eradication of rodents on some southern Atlantic islands that had almost wiped out the island's bird populations after having been introduced in the 18th century by whaling ships. The development and adoption of highly specific herbicides that target only the plant species in question while leaving surrounding vegetation and wildlife relatively unharmed, although overuse can lead to plants becoming resistant over time due to genetic adaptation from surviving seed banks. Introduction of other non-native species to combat a particularly problematic organism has done okay, as well, although this method of fighting fire with fire, you run the risk of new species overtaking the one it was originally introduced to solve, and becoming a problem all of its own, but that sometimes uh, will cross that bridge when we come to a deal. In any case, this is going to be up to us going forward to create far fewer opportunities for non-native species to spread, because this is a problem that's largely on us, and if we don't control it, we could see a world with an already rapidly deteriorating biosphere become even less stable so our grandchildren can inherit a world where the only wildlife they have to look at are pythons, fire ants, and forests of vines as large as Georgia with not a bird in sight because unneutered cats ate them all. As always, if you liked the video, we would really appreciate a like, subscribe, share this video with your friends, and don't forget to hit that bell icon so you get notified of new content as soon as it's posted on the channel. As always, guys, take care, and we'll see you in the next one.